In the last video, I introduced the Dar al Ulum and I talked about some of its precursors and also its original opening. In this video, I'll spend some more time talking about the Dar al Ulum and also some of its contributions. So to begin with, the Dar al Ulum was situated in the in the center, in the center of Cairo, and it actually faced a building known as the the Uk. Mar Mosque, and the Akmar Mosque is still uh, there today, although the Dar al Ilm is no longer, no longer here, but the Akmar Mosque can still be found in the same place. And so the Dar al Ilm in particular faced, faced the Akmar Mosque. Okay? And both of these buildings respectively abutted palaces that were facing each other in the center of Cairo. And so um, the Dar al Ilm in particular abutted the, the westernmost of these two palaces, and then the, the Akmar Mosque was adjoined to the easternmost. Okay, so Hopefully this diagram gives you some sense of how things were laid out back then. So I also want to talk now a bit more about what scholarly subjects and what subject matters were most discussed at the Dar al Ilm. And if you recall, in the previous video, I, I did read from a quote that was attributed to al Musabihi and subsequently was reported by al Makrizi. And from that quote, you can infer some of the activities at the Dar al Ulm and specifically get a sense for the kinds of scholars who visited the Dar al Ulm. But they included uh, what were called uh, Quran readers or, uh, or Qura. Okay. They also included um, jurists. Um, in the Arabic term, I think, was. Uh, uh, these are people who study or really deal with various aspects of the law. Uh, they included people who were experts on tradition, and, and these people are known as the muhaditun. Let me get the diacritical mark in the right place. The muhaditun. Also, um, philologists, and these are people who study languages, and literature, linguistics, uh, grammarians, physicians, logicians, mathematicians, astronomers, and other scientists, and, and so on and so forth. And actually, one particular, one particular astronomer who was at the Dar al Ilm uh, was a man named uh, Ahmad ibn Yunus al Hakimi, and he actually constructed an astronomical chart, uh, which was referred to as the, as the. I'll write it over here, the Al Zij, the Al Zij Al Hakimi. And in this case, the Al Hakimi here refers to the Imam Caliph Al Hakim. Okay. And uh, this particular chart was actually a, a very powerful chart. It was probably one of the most important uh, scientific accomplishments of the Dar al Ilm. It provided comparative data about the planets and the stars. And this particular chart replaced an earlier one that had been developed by astronomers who were working at that time under the Abbasid Caliph al mamun Now, interestingly enough, the astronomers at the Dar al Ilm who were working under Al-Hakim did not yet have access to an observatory of their own. Uh, one was being built, actually, by Malik uh, Ibn Said. So Ibn Said was building an actual, uh, an actual observatory, but that observatory wasn't yet ready. Um, and Ibn Said, by the way, was the supreme uh, Qadi, supreme Qadi under Al-Hakim. Okay? And I, I do want to also point out that um, it was going to be another 100 years or so before the observatory that, that Ibn Said was building was going to be ready. Okay. Now another prominent, very prominent actually, uh, scientist who was working at the Dar al Ilm was a man uh, who went by the name of Ibn al Haytham. Ibn al Haytham, and he actually is also known in the West under the, the name al Hazen. So the Westernized version of Ibn al Haytham is al al Hazen. And Ibn al Haytham or al Hazen made a number of contributions. He was a physician, an astronomer, a mathematician, and a philosopher. And he actually was most noted for his contributions to the field of optics. He actually helped refine and come up with more accurate theories around how 
our eyesight works, okay, and how optics works in general. Uh, another prominent Ismaili scholar at the Dar al Ilm was a man uh, by the name of Al Qadi al Numan. Al Qadi al Numan. Okay, and um, Al Qadi al Numan was uh, a prominent Ismaili scholar. He actually gave lectures at the Dar al Ilm that became known as the Majalis al Hikmah. The Majalis al Hikmah, and Majalis al Hikmah actually stands for, really translates to the, the the sessions of wisdom, the sessions of wisdom. Okay, and these sessions were meant for discussing various aspects of what was called the Ismaili Dawah. They were basically lectures on various aspects of Ismailism. Okay, now scholars at the Dar al Ilm were very, very, very well respected. Uh, they were actually paid a salary, um, and that salary was known as a rizq. Okay, and these salaries were actually paid for from the treasury itself. Now, subsequent to that, Al Hakim actually incorporated the Dar al Ilm into a larger endowment that was associated with the three major mosques in Cairo, uh, and these mosques were the the Al Azhar Mosque, the uh, Rashida Mosque, the Rashida Mosque. And also the uh, Al Mux. Okay. And the annual expenditure of the Dar al Ilm was actually 257 gold dinars per year. Uh, and I've actually itemized that expenditure of uh, 257 dinars. We actually found um, historically there's a fragment of the deed itself. Um, actually, the deed itself, the fragment of the deed, did not itself survive, but there's actually a quote from Al Makrizi where he quotes from a fragment of the deed. And if you if you see the quoted fragment, you can get a sense for how the proceeds of the Dar al Ilm were spent. And I won't read all these here. You may pause the video and read them more carefully if you wish. Uh, but what I want to point out is that there was a lot of money that was spent on paper. Um, papers for the scribe, also for the scholars and, and so on and so forth. As you can see, a large fraction of the proceeds were spent on paper, and I would say approximately 40% or so. And that goes to show the importance, the real importance of being able to preserve knowledge and to further disseminate it, and also how important that was in the context of the Dar al Ilm. Okay, so hopefully this video gave you a flavor for what happened at the Dar al Ilm, at least from a scientific and somewhat historical perspective. I'm going to end this video right here. It's a natural stopping point for me. And what I'll do in the next video is talk specifically about the, the final years and the ultimate decline of the Dar al-Om.